Training camp begins for the New Orleans Pelicans as the restart gets underway to the NBA season with the Pelicans to play their first game on July 30th. And they'll start with the bench playing two really good teams in Utah and the Clippers in their quest to try to get to the play-in spot or even higher to be part of the postseason in Orlando, which will happen barring any other strange developments between now and then in this very strange year. Joining us now to talk about the Pelicans, a gentleman that does an outstanding job and has for several years now writing about the Pelicans and, and doing so on several levels. And he's written for a whole bunch of different entities and done a great job in the process, and he's easily identified with the product in very credible fashion. Jim, I can offer with us now. Jim, listen, I appreciate you joining us considering you, you're in the midst of a travel day, right? Yes, I am. I appreciate the kind words, Ken. I, that's very nice of you to say. It's been, uh, a, a, it's been a joy to cover this team for a while. Even though some of the seasons haven't been great, it's been fun all the way along. Well, it certainly has, and you've been uh, a staple of that coverage, and uh, I deeply respect what you do and appreciate you with us tonight. Look, as far as what's happening right now, of course you get the questions every day too, and, and the answers we all have are who knows. I mean, at this point, uh, they're moving forward. I commend Dave, uh, Adam Silver for doing what he's done. I commend the teams and players for having the fortitude to step up and say, yeah, we'll buy in and we'll do this. And and I respect the guys that have opted out as well. Uh, there's, there's due respect on every side of this. And yet, uh, at least on the whole, from my perspective, it's a good thing that they're going to try to do this. I'm sure you concur. Yeah, and I mean, I think – we probably don't even have time to go through all of the different aspects of, of, of the impact that this is going to have. I know um, people have talked about that if they didn't play, that there could be some serious ramifications on the salary cap and how that was going to affect things going forward. So, I mean, there's a, there definitely are a lot of different motivations. I think everyone also can relate to the fact that every team played 60 plus games. And so it's kind of, it would be, I think it would be kind of a strange feeling to, have played that much of the season and then just have it go away and not complete it. So, I mean, for every team of the 22 teams that are invited to Orlando, I think there's some kind of motivation. Obviously there's some teams that think they can win the championship for the Pelicans. The goal from the beginning of the season was to make the playoffs. So, um, I mean, I think it's, it's going to be a tough situation and there's definitely sacrifices that everyone's going to have to make that you alluded to. But I think that there's a carrot out there in some shape or form for, pretty much every team that's going to be playing in Florida. Some have suggested that perhaps the champion for this year should receive an asterisk. I don't buy into that at all because of what you alluded to previously. The fact that there were over 60 games played prior to now, by the time they're all said and done, they will have played 70 games plus. To me, uh, there's no question that that sets up a real champion based upon the number of games that were played. Yeah, I mean, the list of stuff that you a team has had to overcome to win the championship this year. I think one thing, too, that I'm not sure too many people have talked about or thought about is if, say, Milwaukee wins the championship this year, they'll be the first team in, I think, I'm sure, in NBA history to have gone through the entire playoffs without getting the benefit of having a single home game throughout the whole postseason. So, I mean, it, it, it will be tougher, I think, for relative to other years for the top teams that would have a one seed and we get to play so many games at home and always have an advantage um, on paper as far as you get the first two games in your building, you get game seven in your building, and all of that goes away. So it's really just a – there's really not, not much of an advantage now other than if you're a one seed, obviously you're going to play the eight seed in the first round and your draw is a little bit better. But I think from that standpoint, it is interesting to think about how um, a lot of the, the benefits that you gain from – being a team that wins 60 plus games in the regular season have gone away because really there's obviously not going to be any home court and there's not going to even be fans in the stands at these games in the playoffs. A lot of thoughts about who gains an advantage given the circumstances. And I can see it from a lot of different angles. Anthony Davis saying yesterday that the Lakers are going to be positioned well to win it. They're better off because now they're rested with some players that have a lot of mileage, some tread off the tire they got rest, and so they'll be ready. Then you've got the teams that had players that were banged up or hurt, and Ben Simmons comes to mind where that's concerned who will come back healthy now. And then there's the aspect of the younger, hungry team like the Pelicans who 
might have a mental advantage because of their motivation. Do you see any perspective advantages for teams here, or do you think it's just a fluid situation? I think, I think for the most part, I think teams are going to come up with the scenario that most benefits them in the, in the, in the theoretical uh, formula or, or predictions. You know, obviously what you, you mentioned, what Anthony Davis said, I feel like everyone is going to say, like, okay, well, this benefits us most because of X, Y, Z. But honestly, I think it's just hard. It's so hard to predict. And I think the fact that by the time the Pelicans, for example, play on July 30th, it'll be more than four and a half months since they played their last real game on March 8th. It's so hard to, to even model for what the impact of that is when you're talking about the length of almost a full off season. A lot of times when a team, you know, a, a team that doesn't make the playoffs or a team that gets knocked out early in the playoffs, they might have five months of a, of a summer. And by the time they come back, they're a lot better because, you know, a lot of times in that, that span, players can work on their game. And even from a mental, from a confidence standpoint, sometimes just having time away from the game helps you realize, like, okay, I, I know what I can do at this level, and I'm, next time I get on the court, I'm going to be able to, to show that even more. So I, I honestly don't know. I think there's just so many different factors. And I think hopefully the quality of play will be at a decent level. But I think in terms of the unpredictability, I think that part of it makes it even more interesting, just the fact that, I think compared probably to the normal normal playoffs in postseason, this will be a lot harder to predict what's going to happen just because of all those different factors that we just mentioned. Visiting with Jim Eichenhofer, talking about the New Orleans Pelicans and the NBA restart. So now with, let's focus on the Pelicans as a team. First, I guess the biggest question everyone had is, well, what's Zion Williamson going to look like? Is he going to be in good shape? We all know what happened before the season started and being out for over 40 games and being heavy when he came back. And by the time he got in good shape, he was playing really, really well. We got a good glimpse of the fact that he looks real good right now and says he's in good shape and is ready to go. So I guess you start there. For sure. I mean, he, in the, in the 19 games, I mean, he's had the strangest rookie season for a number one overall draft pick that you could possibly have that he missed. He set out 44 games. He played 19 and actually going even back to preseason, you could tell right away that this guy was going to be a force at this level. So um, it does sound like he did a great job of being consistently on the court. Um, I know people were uh, – you, you have to be concerned about that with any player, of how they, they spend the last three-plus months. But he looks, he looks great, and, it, and he said that he's, he was on the a basketball court every single day. Or I'm sure he might have taken a day off here or there, but pretty much every day he was on the court with his stepfather – so, I mean, that's great to, to, to be in the position that he's in. So, I think, I mean, obviously not just Pelicans fans, but I think all NBA fans, all basketball fans are really excited to see what kind of part two of his rookie season is going to be like. And just based on the fact that even if he does exactly what he did in the first 19 games, it's going to be really um, a huge boost for the Pelicans. But who knows, he might even be take it to another uh, take another step in now that he's had a last, the last few months to kind of probably watch a little film and talk to the coaches and find out, figure out what are some of the things that he can apply to when he gets back on into game action. There was concern about Drew Holiday because of Lauren being pregnant, and we all know what happened the first time in the brain surgery that resulted, and thank God she came through that well, and so did they, but Drew says he's all in, and, and I think that's a big part of why the Pelicans are being looked at in positive fashion because – this is a hungry team. This is a team that wants to be in Orlando. They're together as a team. No real dissenters here, unlike some other teams. And that, to me, certainly bodes well for what their prospects are. For sure. And I think people that followed the team closely from the beginning of the season, you could kind of gradually see that the, the chemistry both on the court and off the court came together as the year went on. And obviously the results started coming, and that helps as far as guys becoming closer and becoming better friends. There were so many new players on the team. I think it was 10 of the 15 guys at the beginning of the season were brand new. So sometimes it takes a little while. But what, what you mentioned as far as Drew and I think J.J. Redick and Derek Favors and Etwan Moore, um, some of the guys like that that have been in the league for a long time and have a lot of experience, they definitely seem like they're all completely in and ready to go. And when I talked about earlier – that you play 60 plus games and then you want to complete that. I think that's a big part of the motivation that they want to show that 
the stretch that they had after Christmas was was no fluke, and that you know they the biggest thing they want to do now is accomplish their goal of making the playoffs, which is what they set out to do all the way back in September. JJ Redick has been outspoken all during the process of social justice and and then about the pandemic and says he's lost 10 pounds and he said he'd be lying if he didn't have cause for pause uh, about things with the pandemic but he's in and will be in and and he's emerged as as a leader but then again I I think they knew that when they signed him right For sure I mean he uh I definitely I thought from the beginning too that they they didn't look at him as like a guy who was going to be constantly talking he's one of those guys that kind of picks his spots obviously the younger players respect him a ton based on the fact that they know he's so proven in the NBA and he's been to the playoffs a million times he made the final in 2009 with Orlando so um, he's definitely somebody that that I think a lot of the younger players lean on and it, it just helps so much to have guys like him and and uh, and Derek Favors that are um just those veteran guys that are just solid, you know what I mean? They're 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 they're, they're so steady. You know what you're going to get from them all the time. They have the same routine constantly because they they figured out what works for them. And I think um, you know that that definitely benefits a team. And I think Favors and Reddick in particular, when the Pelicans added them, I was surprised because I was not expecting that caliber of, of you know veteran guy to be added, but. Man, it seems like it's been so proven of why that was. So, those two moves were so smart by uh, David Griffin last summer. They've got a really good mix. They've got four veteran players who are respected and liked. I include each one more in that to go along with Derek Favors and Holiday and Reddick. And they've got a great nucleus of young players that, that seem to, to get along, seem to like each other, and therefore the future is very, very bright for this team. And the question is, will that future become now? Uh, could this team get to that play-in level? Could they get to the top eight level? Uh, I would think they can. I think the first two games are going to be critical because those are really tough opponents. And, and and the feeling here is that if they can split those first two games, they're going to put themselves in pretty good shape because they've proven they could beat Memphis. Sacramento's in there twice. San Antonio's missing a player. Washington's not very good. So I think there's a real pathway for this team making the playoffs. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think – You've probably people that have been paying attention to some of the media availabilities lately. I think you've heard people emphasize that the first couple games that it's important to get off to a good start. Obviously, when you're only when you have only have eight games on the table, you, there's not a lot of wiggle room. You can't lose two or three games in a row and think everything's going to be fine. So, no, I I totally agree with you. I think that you know obviously you want to win as many games as possible, but to start off the way that they're starting with two teams that are in the top four of the West with Utah and the Clippers. I mean, it, yeah, if they get a split, um, and like you said, a lot of the games after that are teams that are they're fighting with. So instead of having to rely on, okay, we need to win and we need other teams to lose, you actually have the, your, the control in your own destiny a lot more when you're playing some of these teams head-to-head. Um, Sacramento being a good example of that with the two games that you have against them. That, boy, if you win those two games, you could really put the Kings in a bad spot as far as, you know, you'd also have the tiebreaker on them. So um, I – I do like, in a lot of ways, I like the way the schedule sets up. But as you said, um, man, it's, it, it's going to be really important to, to win one of those first couple games. And I think when we really start to examine the math that's even closer, I think we'll realize even more that those games are pretty crucial. A few minutes left with Jim Ike and Offer talking about the New Orleans Pelicans. I look at it as not much differently than others. The Lakers and the Clippers are the best teams in the West. Milwaukee's the best team in the East. If there's a second team in the East for me, I'd probably go Toronto based on what I've seen to this point in the season. If there's a wild card, maybe Philadelphia because of the the inconsistency, but the the high ceiling they have with the players that they have. Your thoughts on who the favorites are and who we might watch for? Yeah, I agree with you there. I think the one team in the East that I like more than Philly is uh, Boston just because they have, I think they have a lot of potential. They have a really good core. I'm totally with you as well on the Toronto thing. I think, you know, Kawhi Leonard is a great player, and he's proven that repeatedly over the course of his career. But I do think some, in some sense when we look back at the finals last year, and, we, and I mean, everyone thought that Toronto was going to drop off a ton going into the season, and they didn't. It just shows the fact that, that it wasn't just Kawhi and a couple of decent players. It, that, that's a really solid squad. They have a bunch of veteran players, and even some of their younger guys like 
um, Siakam and Van Vliet. I think both of those guys, if you if you didn't know anything about them, you'd say, oh, are these guys 10-year veterans? Because that's just the way that they play. So um, I, I'm with you on that. I think the West is, like you said, the two teams from L.A. are, are probably the, the, the top favorites. But I think after that, it's going to be really interesting just because there's a big jumble of teams, whether it's, you know, Houston, Utah, uh, Denver. I think I like Denver a good amount maybe as a sleeper team in the West. But, but, um, but man, it's, I think it's going to be a lot of fun, and it's going to be really interesting to see how, how uh, the standings, you know, end up. And then, obviously, once the playoffs get going. And who handles this bubble best will probably emerge. And some are going to be more comfortable than others, given the fact that they'll basically be isolated with each other. Looking forward to seeing what happens. I think everybody is. And, and I, for one, am happy they're going to try to play. Follow him on Twitter at Jim underscore Eichenhofer. And, of course, read his work. He does an excellent job and, and is well-versed in everything Pelicans. Jim, listen, thanks for the visit and your travel day. Continue to travel safe. Enjoy your Independence Day weekend, and we look forward to visiting with you again soon and continuing to follow your work. Thanks a lot, Ken. Have a, have a great weekend, and thanks for having me. I'd be happy to come on anytime. I appreciate it. It's a pleasure, Jim. Thank you. Appreciate it. Jim, I can offer on the Pelicans, and we appreciate him.